Welcome to the Dry Bones Ministries podcast, where we strive to provide great preaching and teaching so that listeners will discover or rediscover the goodness, truth, and beauty of our Catholic faith. If you are interested in supporting the work we are doing, visit us at drybonespgh.org or follow us on social media at drybonespgh. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you're inspired, uplifted, and encouraged. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a Dry Bones Ministries special podcast series on the Litany of Trust. My name is Father Adam Potter, and today we've made it to day 12. And if you're still here, God bless you. You're still here. You're still listening. And especially after the last uh, couple episodes have been rather lengthy. And yeah, hope hopefully you found them worth your time. I don't think I initially intended on these episodes getting this long, but there's a lot to say, and sometimes it could be uh, a lot shorter. I remember one uh, very wise person um, making excuses for why it's so long. I forget if he was talking about his homily or a paper that he was writing. Anyway, he apologized and said, sorry my homily's so long, I didn't have enough time. The idea, you know, sorry, sorry the paper's so long, if I would have had more time it could have been shorter. Like, oftentimes the hard thing isn't finding things to say, it's finding the way to say it concisely. And so, uh, that may be a, a part of my, uh, contributing to my own lengthy podcasting. And anyway, hopefully the Lord can use it. I know we can. Of course, Jesus, I trust in you. You can use it. You can use it all and bring about a, a greater good. So, Today, we dive into a real invitation to a place in my own heart that has been super challenging. It's the invitation to poverty, accepting our limitations, accepting our littleness before the Lord. Here's the invitation for day 12. From the fear of being asked to give more than I have, deliver me, Jesus. I want to bring you to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. These are four simple lines in Luke's Gospel, but they really capture this this moment where Jesus is with his disciples and he's inside the temple right there in front of the, the treasury. And all of these rich individuals are coming and dropping off these big contributions, one after the next after the next. And then Jesus notices this poor woman who puts in two copper coins and he grabs the attention of his disciples, right? Who are, you know, they're looking at how beautiful the temple is, looking at all these different sights and wonders. He says, look, look, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the living that she had. They all gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all the living, the bios in Greek, the, the very like life that she has, all the living that she had. So Jesus wants us to have our attention drawn to this offering of our poverty, this giving out of our poverty, and how important it is that Jesus would draw the attention of his disciples, and by extension, through the living word of God, you and me, to really come to appreciate the power, the efficaciousness of giving the little that we have, living out of this place of, but it's not a lot, or it's not the extra, it's not the, it's not enough to like make a difference, you know, yeah, all the different things that we can say, and, and as opposed to seeing here in this limitation that I have, I give it all, I give it all to you. And so, wow, what a question to consider. Where do we like to give out of our own abundance, out of our surplus, out of our strength? Here's where it's been challenging for me. I I love to be generous when it's out of my abundance, when, when it's out of my... Right, an abundance could, could be something like, um, yeah, some, someone gave me a donation or I found this extra, like, a amount of money someplace and and then I find a a co- good cause to be able to give to and oh look well this money was 
extra to begin with. So here, I can put in this extra 20, this extra 50 towards this cause. It's like, wow, you just gave $50? It's like, right. It actually didn't cost me anything because it was extra that I have, right? That's an example of giving out of the abundance, out of the surplus, as opposed to out of the poverty. It's like, wait, if I give this $20, I'm not going to be able to eat lunch, eat the same lunch that I thought I was going to have. That all of a sudden, out of the poverty, reveals the generosity. It shows a trust in the Lord that when I give this, the Lord will feed me. He'll give me what I need in that, in that case situation to survive or, or to offer it as a, a meaningful fast. Here's an, another way too, in terms of giving out of my strength, out of my abundance. I just think about different activities that... Uh, I would invest in or be involved in, and I'm very willing to be involved in an activity that I'm strong in, that I have gifts or talents or abilities where I can stand out. And growing up playing sports my whole life, it was very easy for me to be involved in, in sports because I knew that I was going to be able to compete and maybe even stand out and kind of be noticed. I'm like, wow, you're you're really good. You're really whatever. It's like, I love, you know, being generous in those instances because I have a lot to give. But all of a sudden I'm asked to like, hey, we're going to do something in the realm of theater or arts or music. And it's like, uh, I'm a horrible singer. I have no acting ability. I have no, get, like, get, like, sorry, I'm, I'm, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, like, what is that? It's, uh, I love to give when, it's out of my abundance, out of my strength when I when I can be recognized for it. But I don't like giving or being available to something where maybe I'm not going to stand out or where I'm going to be noticed as not having much to offer or to contribute. Um, and so how about with the Lord in terms of being called to really trust in Him and to be generous with Him? I can give you so many examples of this and in my own life as a priest and apply it to your own vocation where being called out of the comfort zone and just i forget who said it but it's like if you want to follow the lord and faithfully get really comfortable with being uncomfortable we just have to because he's gonna stretch us he's gonna bring us to these places where i'm i'm not in my comfort zone it's this isn't out of a place that I, I really studied or I really know all the, the responses or, I, yeah, I know what I'm doing. There's so many times where I remember the first time going to the ICU and, yeah, going to, I think it was Presby downtown and the first time there, brand new priest and just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to talk to. And now it's kind of second nature at that time. It was just frightening and and I didn't even know who I was going to see, if there was going to be anybody there. And yeah, on the ICU, I just remember like finally getting there, having the name, having the number. And there's like doors open up and they, they buzzed me in because I'm a priest. It's like, yeah, of course, you you can be here. You're, you should be here. In my mind, I'm like, I'm an imposter. <laughs> I don't belong here. I don't, I'm, I'm out of my element. Like I, they're going to see me. They're going to see right through me. And so as a new priest, it was coming to like really believe in this identity that the, the Lord was, was giving me, had given me, and wanted me to live out of. So, but this fear was that in this lack, right, out of this poverty, out of this, what happens when I finally get there? And I talk to this person and they're in this intensive care situation and I can't fix it or I can't. I don't know what to say. I don't have anything to like make it all make it all better. What then? And yeah, this beautiful situation was I, I came to this woman who surprisingly I did know and that I had visited before. And here this woman was just suffering so much. And here I felt like I was coming with just nothing to offer. And in that way, she was the one receiving me. And she's like, Father, you're here. Like, how do you know? It's like, 
I knew, like I was told, it, yeah, I got the, and she was just like, it just means so much that you're here and we're able to pray a rosary together, pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and right, the Lord was just teaching. It wasn't about me having anything to give, but for me to be, for me just to be present to or the Lord was able to work. And I didn't say anything significant, meaningful, or insightful, containing any element of wisdom, but I was there. I was there just like really striving to trust in the Lord um, and fighting to overcome this fear, huh? So maybe you can relate to this. From the fear of being asked to give more than I have, deliver me. Deliver me, Jesus. So, do you have that fear in anything in your own in your own life? At the bottom of page 76, she gives some examples of where this fear might prick our hearts or consciences. Is it a fear that we'll fall short? Is it a fear that we won't be enough? That will let someone else down? Is it a fear that we'll be embarrassed? And sometimes we can wonder if God is setting us up for failure. He doesn't know me, or he's mistaken about me. I can't possibly do what he's asking. Another child now? Do I have it in me? Caring for my elderly parents? Breaking this addiction? Defending my faith at work? I can't. So those are those are a couple I I thought good examples of, yeah, that maybe you've been there, of kind of realizing you're being asked to step up, to speak to something, or to say yes to something that would just really um, put you on the brink of your comfort zone, of having what, what you have, and all of a sudden there's this fear of not having enough. And so what do we do? This is where it's really important for us to recognize all the ways that we can strive to cover up this fear of not having enough. And so, so many of us will strive to really save up. Financial security is this big, big coping mechanism to cover up this fear of living out of a poverty. And by poverty, I mean an acceptance of our limitations and a dependency on God. And so to, to live in this littleness where, where I, I need to depend on God for everything. And I, I'm free as well to accept my limitations. That I haven't studied everything. I don't know all the things to say or to do. And I don't always have something to offer. And it's in that poverty that we open up the pathway to God's blessing. How? Because accepting of our poverty puts us in a disposition to trust in our Heavenly Father. And it's in this that grace is free to flow. It just seems like those three things, right? Acceptance of poverty leads to trust in the Father that then leads to God able to pour His love through us and grace freely flowing. So, we fight this all the time because, yeah, out of, out of this fear. And so, yeah, there can be a, a whole lot of ways that yeah, we only do those things that we're comfortable in. We save up and don't accept different responsibilities until we're in this financial security or intellectual security or relationship security, status security, whatever it is. It's like security, security, security. The Lord wants to blow up some of those securities in our lives so that we can be free to really allow God to give, to bless us, to bless this, um, dependence on on him i thought sister faustina brought us right to the heart of this with jesus in um in the gospel she points out simon of cyrene and mm, i guess there are two moments here in in uh in the gospels there's simon of cyrene and then there's peter and the the moment of uh after the resurrection on the sea of galilee so first, just to appreciate that Simon of Cyrene was able to see Jesus live out the trust in the Father while carrying his cross. This is beautifully captured in the... Oh, why am I blanking on the, the Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson? Where Simon of Cyrene, and you know, innocent bystander, nothing to do with, with this, 
Meanwhile, he's a faithful Jew. He's coming to Jerusalem to offer the Passover sacrifice. He himself is coming to slaughter a lamb and to offer it as his family. And meanwhile, no idea does he know that he's being invited to partake in the perfect Paschal sacrifice, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so there he's invited to be shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, carrying that cross. And, and to be able to look at Jesus, who witnesses this, right? This is, a, again, the theme of Jesus throughout this litany of trust. He doesn't call us to anything that he himself is not willing to do, or in the different instances of, instances of the gospel that he hasn't already done. And so that he would call us to take up our cross, he's going to carry it first, that he's going to call us to give out of our poverty. Look at him. He literally fell carrying his own cross. This wasn't something that he accepted because he had the strength to do it. He obviously didn't have the strength. That's why Simon was asked to come in. Was he ever tempted to think that he was a failure? Because he couldn't, like, the one thing that he was sent to earth to do, to save humanity, to save us from our sins, he couldn't even do it himself. Right? Like, that's, I don't know that I've even talked that out myself until right now, <laughs> saying it into this podcast. Wow. Like, the depths of Jesus' humility to come all the way to humble himself, to enter into our humanity so that he can save us from our sins. And he comes so low that he actually needs to depend on us to trust and father. And he doesn't, he doesn't need us. He chooses to need us. This is this, the freedom that he has. And this is the depths of his love that he invites us into this redeeming work. And so Simon of Cyrene, that he might stand in the place of all of us. Um, to be able to look into the face of Jesus who is fearless and abandoning himself to this poverty, this limitation. And it's in the full depths of emptying himself of his own strength, of his own surplus wealth, gifts, abilities, talents, that he's free to perfectly trust in the Heavenly Father. Even with Simon, they fall uh, time and again and getting up, and getting up, and what a witness, huh? To see in this carrying of the cross the, the depths of trust and a renun renunciation of the fear that I won't have enough. A great thing to um, pray with would be the, the Gospel of John, chapter 21, where Jesus has breakfast with his disciples. Um, Give me a moment, I'm going to turn there, and we can just see how, how the depths of Jesus' love uh, is poured out for Simon. So they, they come to the shore after this incredible catch, and Jesus speaks to, speaks to Simon Peter and asks him these three questions. You've heard this gospel before, but just to appreciate Jesus asking Simon, Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And maybe you've heard this before, but, and this is really significant. We miss it in English. But in the Greek, Jesus asks Simon, Peter, Do you agape me? Do you love me with this selfless, sacrificial love? And Simon's response is, Yes, Lord, you know that I philia you. A love of a brother, the love of a friend. So Jesus is calling Simon Peter to not just repent and to find forgiveness for the ways that Simon Peter um, abandoned him. Do you love me more than these? I've heard that it's kind of mysterious, but I've heard that as being a reference to the fact that Simon Peter boldly proclaimed, Lord, even if all of these other, even if these other apostles abandon you, I will never abandon you. Do you remember that? That's in the Gospel of Luke where he says that. And so here Jesus 
It says, you said you would love me, you'd be faithful to me more than all of these. Do you love me more than these? A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And yes, Lord, you know that I feel you, you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then a third time, a third time is significant because Simon Peter, as predicted by Jesus, would three times deny that he ever knew Jesus. And so this third time to atone for the three betrayals, Jesus asks him, Simon, son of John, do you? And then here's where it changes. Do you, do you feel you me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. What a good thing for us to um, take to prayer and to really allow the Lord to ask us this question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Sister Faustina at the end of this chapter, I think has an incredible insight that this wasn't just about a repentance, a reparation, an acknowledgement of recommitting himself to be faithful to the Lord. No, this love is an invitation to know who Jesus is. Here's what she says. Jesus was not only drawing out from Peter a proclamation to repent of his denials, but was longing to show Peter who he really was. As his Savior, Jesus had the trust Peter was lacking. In accepting the feeble yet sincere love of Peter, Jesus was saying, I know you, and I want you to know me. I want you to believe that trusting in my love more than in your own strength shows me that you know me. Jesus has already carried our crosses and won that ability to trust for us especially when it seems like God is asking more than we can have. How God honors us by bringing the nobility of his love to the depths of our frailty. That last line is stuck with me. and I need to take that to prayer. How God honors us by bringing the nobility of his love to the depths of our frailty. That precisely in our poverty, in our limitations, in our littleness, that God is really able to honor us as precisely in those places. His love, His grace is most clearly seen and noticed because, it, because it's not us. It's so obviously not us out of our comfort zone and in these moments of limitations. Um, so spend some time with that John 21. Spend some time really looking at where are these places that I have this fear of being asked to give more than I have, of falling short, of disappointing, of um, just not being enough. Is that a fear that we have, that I, that I won't be enough? And to allow Jesus in these moments of invitation, do you love me? Do you love me? It's the question of, do you know me? Do you know that I myself has, have completely abandoned myself to the Father that I've witnessed to the fact that it's only in accepting fully the limitation of our humanity that we can come to most perfectly trust in our Father and to find that when we don't have enough, seemingly, that's when we are able to find the strength of God right there. So I don't know what you're going through or what situation in your own life um, or in the, this world, or in your own work, or in your own family has like brought you there, and maybe you're at a place like that right now, and what an incredible thing just to make this real um, act of renouncing that fear that I, that I don't have enough, that I am not enough, and to make this act of trust. Jesus, I choose to trust in you. I choose to take that next step. I choose to make myself available and to allow you to really come through and to show me once again who you are. That you are good, you are true, you are faithful, and you will give me everything that I need. With that, let's turn to our litany and pray. Pray for the, that grace as I've been inviting you to, just the, the grace to be able to pray this litany wholeheartedly. 
from the depths of our being. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Litany of Trust From the belief that I have to earn your love, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that I am unlovable, deliver me, Jesus. From the false security that I have what it takes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that trusting you will leave me more destitute, deliver me, Jesus. From all suspicion of your words and promises, deliver me, Jesus. From the rebellion against childlike dependency on you, deliver me, Jesus. From refusals and reluctances in accepting your will, deliver me, Jesus. From anxiety about the future, deliver me, Jesus. From resentment or excessive preoccupation with the past, deliver me, Jesus. From restless self-seeking in the present moment, deliver me, Jesus. From disbelief in your love and presence, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being asked to give more than I have, deliver me, Jesus. From the belief that my life has no meaning or worth, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of what love demands, deliver me, Jesus. From discouragement, deliver me, Jesus. That you are continually holding me, sustaining me, loving me. Jesus, I trust in you. That your love goes deeper than my sins and failings and transforms me. Jesus, I trust in you. That not knowing what tomorrow brings is an invitation to lean on you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are with me in my suffering. Jesus, I trust in you. That my suffering united to your own will bear fruit in this life and the next. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will not leave me orphan. That you are present in your church. Jesus, I trust in you. That your plan is better than anything else. Jesus, I trust in you. That you always hear me and in your goodness always respond to me. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me the grace to accept forgiveness and to forgive others. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me all the strength I need for what is asked. Jesus, I trust in you. That my life is a gift. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will teach me to trust you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are my Lord and my God. Jesus, I trust in you. That I am your beloved one. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode. To learn more about Dry Bones Ministries, events, and initiatives, and to support this podcast, go to drybonespgh.org. Thanks, and God bless you.